Having read that Vancouver, Canada had the greatest number of marijuana smokers and growers per capita, Emery decided to move there and cater to that market. By the time he returned to Canada in 1994, Emery's plan was largely in place. He had parted with Freedom Party's belief that the role of government was to defend individual rights. He instead regarded government as nothing but a violator of individual rights. With the restoration of individual freedom as his desire, the defeat of the government became his goal. He would attempt to accomplish the government's defeat by culturing hatred for the state. Taking his cue from Gandhi and Martin Luther King, his effort would take the form of defending a large class of people from civil rights abuses by the state. To that end, he would unite under one banner the millions who, as implicit members of what he would call the cannabis culture, already were choosing to violate laws prohibiting the cultivation, trade, possession, or use of marijuana. He would lead the marijuana people who contributed to that culture by sacrificing for them, winning their admiration, and setting himself up to be martyred so that their sympathy for him would be accompanied by seething hatred for the government that victimized him and them. Marijuana cultivation, trade, possession, and use is an inherently peaceful form of civil disobedience, but disobedience would not be enough. If disobedience was to have an expressed purpose and direction, one determined by Mark, Mark would have to do what he did before, start his own publication. So when we started, first thing, I, I looked at the feminist community and I looked at the gay community and I thought, what do they have? Well, they have, they have a media. If you want to communicate directly to your group or the people you're, you're soliciting support, you need media. So we immediately established a magazine. Although Canada's ban against marijuana literature remained in force, Mark began publishing a marijuana and hemp newsletter. But publishing and distribution costs a lot of money. If Emery was going to effectively communicate with the troops and to build a powerful civil rights organization, he was going to need a very effective way of raising revenue. The lubricant of liberty is money. That not only is mon making money a good thing, but it's essential to make money in order to get people to take your ideas seriously. You need money to get out to the public. You need to make money so that you not, don't get burnout. Money buys you options. Money buys you choices. Money gives you opportunity. All those things will make you much happier. You look at, a, you look at an activist without money, he's working a lot harder for the same result of somebody who's an activist with money. Anything without money just doesn't go anywhere. I, I'm almost, you know, like an idealism without cash is really like you're going to get your brake, spin your wheel. So I'm a big believer in money. I'm a hardcore capitalist realist. And one of the things I learned after 10 years of frustrating political activism is that I hated to beg for money to pay for political activity. I hate to say it, people do, do give money occasionally, but never enough to really do it. And they give money in politics to buy influence. People, when they spend money, they want results. They want a product. They want something to show. Running for election is expensive. The Freedom Party does fundraising among its members, but it needs more. That's where its philosophy of self-reliance comes in. The Freedom Party is also a business. The latest project is a calendar of individual freedoms featuring the icons of its laissez-faire philosophy. The party is expecting to raise about $30,000 from the U.S. edition of the calendar. We're trying to move more into giving them a physical product. We don't like to be beggars like political parties are assumed to be. We like to be uh, producers, a goods provider, somebody who's going to give you some value for what it is we're asking you to give us. Is this a business? Well, everything that has to survive has got to be treated like a business, uh, except love. But I mean, that's different. But definitely in politics, you've got to provide your market, that's the public, with something they can use, something they want, something they will continue to come back for. I thought, oh man, I could raise like two, three hundred bucks, you know, by begging all night for people to give money. And I thought, this is frustrating to me. I said, I need a revolutionary form of capitalism that will generate its own money to finance a revolution against the government. He returned to doing what he had done before with impunity. He began importing High Times magazine and Grow Your Own Stone and sold them door to door and to variety stores who could not otherwise access them. By July of 1994, he had earned enough money to open his own storefront, Hemp BC. It sold not only the illegal publications, but also a wide range of legal and illegal marijuana and hemp related paraphernalia and other products. 
Hi, my name is Mark Emery. I'm publisher of this wonderful Canadian classic, Grow Your Own Snow. It sold over 200,000 copies in Canada since 1971 and was even banned for six years and almost bankrupted the author and his publisher. But we're back. We're back as Hemp BC. We operate six days a week. Every day we're a hemp activist lobby right downtown in Vancouver. We give free information. We have every kind of grow guide, hemp guide, guide to solving every medical problem you have with marijuana. My name is Mark Emery and I've spent the last two years in Asia smoking marijuana really cheap. Did you know, for example, you can get a kilo, a kilo I tell you, of good marijuana in India for only $250 Canadian. Why, you can pay for your trip there at that price. And if you go to Indonesia, you can get two kilos for only $350. And we, in our monthly newsletter, the Hemp and Marijuana Newsletter, tell you how to go about buying these things in Indonesia and in India, but don't smoke in Malaysia or Singapore. Don't even look at pots in Singapore and Malaysia, okay? That kid who got his ass rotan, that'd be nothing if you got caught with a kilo in Malaysia, let me tell you. But you shouldn't get caught. And if you get this newsletter, the Hemp and Marijuana Newsletter, we will tell you how to avoid all that. In India, they don't sort of have Western concepts of time. But anyway, you get pot really cheap there. And they use it in Ayurvedic medicine, so you get an Ayurvedic body massage while you're smoking. It's all therapy. That's what I like. They accept that there. But anyway, they'll soon accept that here because we're working full time to kick some ass, raise some consciousness, and generally have a good time. By October of 1994, Emory had become Canada's biggest distributor of illegal High Times magazines. But in October of 1994, an Ontario court ruled that the law against marijuana literature was unconstitutional. Shortly after that decision was rendered, Emory lost the distributorship to High Times magazine to larger Canadian distributors. Breaking the law had changed the law, and the sale of the magazine was taken out of the hands of outlaws and put into the hands of regulated distributors. But the decision did not address the issue of selling marijuana paraphernalia, so Emory's Hemp BC store remained a thriving concern, selling bongs, pipes, clothing, and other marijuana and hemp-related products. In November of 1994, while attending the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam, Emery met Ben Dronkers, whose seed-selling efforts in Holland had led to the cultivation of millions of marijuana plants there. Emery was instantly inspired to do the same in North America, and upon his return to Canada from Holland, he immediately started selling seeds over the counter at Hemp BC. The proceeds from the sale of the seeds would give the cannabis culture the economic power it needed to oppose marijuana prohibition effectively. With the demise of the law against marijuana literature in Canada, Emery's Marijuana and Hemp newsletter became a glossy-covered magazine, the name of which would be changed to Cannabis Canada in the next issue. Like the newsletter before it, Cannabis Canada would keep Canadians across the country aware of developments in marijuana law, marijuana activism, marijuana and hemp culture, and of course, Mark Emery himself. In the very first issue of Cannabis Canada, Emery laid out his marijuana manifesto, which he called The Five Conditions for Peace. He demanded the legalization of cannabis, the lifting of regulations on who may cultivate and distribute it, an unconditional pardon for all Canadians who had been convicted of cannabis-related offenses, the payment of restitution for people who had spent days in jail over marijuana offenses, and an official apology from the Prime Minister of Canada to Canadians of the cannabis culture. He ended the manifesto with a quote from Martin Luther King. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty we are free at last! The seed money allowed Emery to move the Hemp BC store into a larger facility across the street, just opposite the Cenotaph at Victory Square, and to start a number of spin-off businesses. We started the little grow shop and we would teach people all around the clock daily how to grow pot, put up the wiring in their house, build grow systems for them. It was fabulous. We started the Cannabis Cafe, which is modeled on an Amsterdam cafe, really, where we had hemp in all the foods to show people what you could do with the hemp seed food. Then we published a book saying, a little manual which we gave out free and distributed to anybody. You can do this in your own like neighborhood, home, whatever, for like 10,000 US or $15,000 Canadian. You can start your own business, be a revolutionary, be your own Howard work, have fun, cause trouble, smash the state. But the seeds themselves would perform a second function. Overgrowing the government. And what is overgrowing? Using plants in a form of peaceful revolution to totally drive the U.S. and Canadian governments mad by having millions and millions of marijuana plants grown all over and having them use thousands and thousands of agents of oppression to go and try and destroy them all. And I often told the media, and this is what bothers the DEA, I said never underestimate the power of one person fighting an unjust law. I said I used to boast that my effort to print marijuana all over North America neutered the effect of thousands of DEA and RCMP agents every day. 
because I would be using the resources of all these government agencies to deal and destroy what I had created. One person had helped create enough to keep hundreds and hundreds of them busy. And I thought, if this were emulated, we could run them ragged. One person would literally, in kind of like a lateral or, or an asymmetrical war, one person, by just growing plants, harmless plants, can actually run the state ragged and bankrupt by draining all their resources. And so, not only was I doing this, I was encouraging everyone else I could find, you can do this too. You, there's no better way to subvert the foundation of immoral government than to drain their resources, make them use money peacefully. I mean, what are these people doing? They're spending billions of dollars destroying planets. It's absurd, but it's a brilliant, re it's a brilliant weapon for revolution. A peaceful revolution, an overgrowing the government. Instead of overthrowing, which implies violence, overgrowing implies botany. Peaceful use of botany <laughs> to smash the state. It's flawless. Selling marijuana seeds would be a double whammy. It would raise money for the anti-prohibition forces while draining the resources of their opponent, the government. For over a year, Emery continued to sell marijuana seeds at his Hemp BC store without anyone complaining, with the police knowing, and with the Canadian and local governments content not to stop it. The American establishment was quick to take notice of that fact. On December 5, 1995, the Wall Street Journal ran a front page story about Emery with the headline, Pot Seed Merchant, Winked at by Police, Prospers in Canada. The story quoted Vancouver Police spokesperson Constable Ann Drennan as saying that he's blatant, but he's not a priority. She explained that we don't want to send out the message that it's okay, but Vancouver has more serious crimes to worry about. A subsequent story in the National Enquirer, titled Millionaire Drug Dealer is Never Busted Because He Pays Taxes, again quoted Constable Drennan as saying that Emery is blatant, but not one of the Vancouver police's top priorities. On January 6, 1996, just a few weeks after the Wall Street Journal story hit the newsstands, the Vancouver police raided Hemp, B.C., seizing pot paraphernalia and various files related to the Cannabis Canada publication. Emery became the first person charged in Vancouver history for selling cannabis seeds. And Constable Ann Drennan was there to take questions. Drennan denied that the Vancouver police had chosen to raid Emery's store because of the U.S. publications. Her story was that it had simply taken some time to raid the Hemp BC store because they first had to prove that the seeds being sold by Mark Emery were viable. She explained that the seeds grew very well. Within a day or so, Emery's store was back up and running. Emery began selling seeds by mail order. It was after one of the raids, when, uh, when we were after the first raid, and we were desperate for money, the magazine had been late, and I remember Mark saying, take out that NBC catalog, we're putting in a seed catalog in there instead. And there was some controversy among the staff as to whether that was a good idea or not, or whether that would cause problems, but never caused any problems for us, and I think it's helped, you know, and ultimately, as, as things progressed and more raids happened, Mark changed the whole business into mail order, and that's really... You know, the magazine and the mail order business have sort of grown symbiotically together, I think, where they help support each other. Yeah. So it was really, a, you know, kind of a bold move to, after being raided for selling seeds, to actually push the seed business more by pushing it into the magazine, but it and worked out well. The first few pages of Mark's Cannabis Canada magazine would serve as a catalog of all of the various kinds of marijuana seeds that were available through Mark Emery Direct. To promote his mail order seed business, Emery, who was a master of the art of turning life's lemons into lemonade, began quoting Drennan in his ads and thereby had the police endorsing the quality of his seeds. The first raid on Emery's Hemp BC led to national coverage on CBC's Big Life with host Daniel Richler. Our first guest tonight is Mark Emery. He's among the one in four Canadians who've tried dope and one of the six and a half percent who use it regularly. He's also the publisher of Cannabis Canada magazine and an outspoken advocate for the legalization of marijuana. He owns a store in Vancouver called Hemp BC that sells hemp products, smoking materials and cannabis seeds. It was the sale of those seeds that brought police into the picture. Earlier this year, the police raided Hemp BC, arresting Emery and some of his staff. He was charged with trafficking. It's believed to be the first time that cannabis seeds have formed the basis for such a charge. He expects to go to trial later this year. Mr. Emery, you were busted recently. I would say you were kind of asking for it. I mean, did you want to get busted so you could get a chance to win the legal right to sell cannabis seeds? I remember when you had a bookstore in London, Ontario, you were virtually inviting the police to arrest you because you wanted to challenge Canadian laws on drug literature in court. What Richler didn't realize was that Emery had ceased to try to change the law through the court system after the court failed to protect his individual rights during the two-life crew trial and appeal.
in 1990 and 91. And I find that even our legal system is, is totally corrupt, is totally worthless, and can't be used to achieve any kind of social justice. So The court system is just so laughable. I mean, I mean, obviously I have complete contempt for it, and, and every time I go to court, I learn another reason why it has no validity. So Emery gave an answer designed to spark the taxpayers' outrage against government. Well, I like the idea of having the legal right to sell cannabis seeds as a victory kind of thing, but, you know, we lost $105,000 cost price in inventory, and my legal fees are about $50,000, and the taxpayer is going to be responsible for a quarter million dollars in court costs. So, you know, I, I guess it's a noble thought to want to win in court, but it's an expensive and painful process to have to get there. Of course, I got the reaction that ultimately I thought one day I would see. But it still comes as a shock to you because we'd been doing selling seeds and, and selling everything about marijuana for about a year and a half without any interference. And the police had never told me once that they had found this illegal or objectionable. They would tell that to the media occasionally, but they'd never spoken to me about it. Despite this being national coverage, Emery's appearance on the CBC, a Canadian medium, did not prompt another raid on his store. The first raid on his store was actually a foreshadowing of a Canada-U.S. relationship in which the USA said jump and Canadian police said how high. Generally they try and suppress me whenever I get major media attention and we've got a lot coming up. I'm in Harper's, Talk Magazine, <laughs> Trina Brown's Magazine has a section. Rolling Stone's going to have a wonderful laudatory. The more flattering it is, the more I'm likely to get my ass kicked soon. But uh, some of the wonderful things we've been able to do with this earning of money is when the APEC conference was in uh, British Columbia in late 1997 and you'll know about that because since then they've had a government inquiry about police pepper spraying protesters and what have you but of course at the time when it was going on all these world leaders were only four blocks away from my camp cannabis cafe hemp BC location so we bought full page ads in the newspapers both daily newspapers in a special edition that was delivered to every single delegate this is the, and of course, every single ad that was bought, you can only buy a full page ad, was by FedEx and TELUS and IBM and everybody like that. And then they came to a page that had cannabis leaves all around the edge, and then a big headline saying, Stop the war on marijuana people. And we addressed the situation. <laughs> we addressed each country's human rights record on marijuana. Of course, the United States, Singapore, Malaysia were all appalling and we castigated them thoroughly and urged them to change their ways and more importantly come down and smoke a joint with me and I'll tell you more. That's what we said. <laughs> and, uh, and then when it came out I was so proud of those ads because I know that every delegate would have just opened it and like a bombshell, you know, FedEx, good, more corporate kissing, more, you know, going on all these people paying, like, yes, we love all you dictators and stuff, right? <laughs> all these ass kissing corporate ads and then our stunner, right? It's like the Suharto was there, oh my god, I can't see that, you know, he'd been resisting any kind of criticism at all and then in the middle of the daily newspaper, and I know a lot of people from all the foreign countries ask, can they do this? I mean, this is illegal and this guy is soliciting our support for this drug activity four blocks away and of course all our staff, when we opened it, we all looked at each other, yeah, it's great, but we're going to get our ass kicked. America was about to confer on him not only a great amount of international attention, but also a moniker. We have Mark Emery with us. The, I, you are not the self-professed Prince of Pot. That is a name that you say the media has actually given to you. Uh, American media, CNN and whatnot. That's right. Impact correspondent Larry Lamont reports from Vancouver where police tolerance is being tested by a flamboyant businessman considered Canada's Prince of Pot. We talked about Mark Emery's pot business with the head of Vancouver's drug squad, Sergeant Coase Dykstra. Okay, why not close it down? Do you perceive it as a big enough problem for us to close it down when people are being knifed, murdered, and mugged? Dykstra believes the war on drugs has been a failure and has even made the problem worse. You'd have to be a real dolt to think that we're actually improving the situation. But you're never going to stop people from using psychoactives. And by doing so, all you're doing is building up a, a criminal empires. Al Capone and the boys got their start with prohibition of liquor. But Sergeant Dykstra's wisdom on the matter appeared later to have been trumped by political pressure from above. Weeks later, on December 16, 1997, Vancouver police again raided Hemp, B.C. They seized tens of thousands of dollars in inventory, but when they seized Emery, the crowd erupted. Yeah, 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 yeah
was standing there and they grabbed him from behind the neck. He didn't move or move out no. or anything. No, they grabbed him from behind the neck, threw him to the ground, and they started choking him. He had red marks on his neck. He didn't do anything to resist them. They just threw him down and choked him. Why do you think they did that? Because our society is coming to a, to a terrible, I don't know, it's, just, it's pathetic and it's really sad that this has happened to Canada, a country of freedom. Where is my freedom? I want to know that. And the name on the search warrant? None other than Sergeant Dykstra's. Do you perceive it as a big enough problem for us to close it down? When people are being knifed, murdered, and mugged. The following day, a crowd assembled outside of Emery's store, and he gave them a speech to remember. How does, how does BCTV promote the fact that THC can help glaucoma, help wasting syndrome, help people with AIDS, help people with multiple sclerosis as fact, and then come here and tell us that the very instruments you would use to smoke that life-saving marijuana is to be banned, is to be illegal, is to be seized, as though that is somehow tantamount to a crime. That's our instrument of the product. That's our instrument of love. That's how we get high. We need those pipes, and we need those bonds, and we need those rolling papers. We need more hacks, more pus, and I and as my final parting thought, one day I'm going to be mayor of this city and I'm going to apologize to all of you. Because we are owed an apology. This is 60 years of cultural genocide. We've been beaten. We've had advertising bought about us that scapegoats us, that demonizes us. We've had our property seized, our children taken away from us. We've been kicked out of school. We've been kicked out of work. We've been urine tested out of the job market. This pogrom's got to end, and I'm going to end it. We're going to end it together. And one day when I'm mayor, I will apologize to all of you on behalf of the government of Vancouver for the terrible treatment you and I have received. All of you. But a run for the mayor's office was going to have to wait. Just weeks after giving his speech, Emery was forced to sell Hemp BC. Why did you sell Hemp BC? Well, basically, I was I had a gun put to my head from both the police and City Hall who said, if you don't get out of town and cease business immediately, we're just going to raid you again and take all your assets and bankrupt you. And it was said as simple as that. They weren't even going to wait for any court challenges or anything. I was given a notice, you have 10 days to cease and desist. And if you don't do it, we're just going to bankrupt you. In fact, it's like a pogrom in, in Russia at the turn of the century. I was given three or four days to sell. I got 10% of its proper value. And I had to leave town as soon as it was done. And in fact, I'm barred from ever going there again. Shortly after I sold them, within days, the police had arrested me uh, because I had allegedly given some American tourists $5 worth of hash as a gift. And they went back to the border, reported this. Next thing you know, I was in jail overnight. And they wouldn't release me unless I took on an undertaking that said I would never go back to that my old stores again. And so I'm barred. I haven't seen them since I sold them. Shortly after that interview, the April 2nd, 1998 issue of Rolling Stone included a two-page profile on the cannabis culture scene in Vancouver and Mark Emery's leadership of it. Erroneously thinking that Emery still owned the store, four weeks later, with a warrant having Emery's name on it, the Vancouver police again raided Hemp, B.C. Crime. Organized crime is what we're witnessing right here. The police also raided the offices of Cannabis Canada magazine at 199 West Hastings, where they found Emery sitting at his desk working. Hey Mark, what's going on, man? Um, they're making a raid on HempBC and uh, they're coming here to seize all documentation relating to any business that went on as HempBC. And they're apparently not going to, they're going to seize our computers that contain records of our business. We haven't owned HempBC for two months. And uh, they're seizing records related to HempBC. So no actual products. So they're going to kick a door down in the stock room because we don't have a key available right now. And uh, they're going to seize all uh, computers and documentation related to when we used to own HempBC when we're presumed. And they're going to try not to take anything to do with Cannabis Canada magazine, but I suspect that there's going to be stuff going on like that, too. Mark Emery have a no-go for this whole block? No, it's a 200 block right here, so I'm technically allowed on this little squad. 
Mark, tell me what you think about what's going on here tonight. Well, it's curious. I must have been, this must be the Rolling Stone article I paid for because my name's on the warrant and I haven't owned that business for two months. The premises of Mark and a person unknown with all this information at City Hall. I filled out all their forms. I complied with all their demands. They know who I am. They know where I live. They know what I do. They're raiding my magazine right now and seizing computers that are strictly limited to printing a magazine and publishing Cannabis Canada and. Uh, I don't know, I guess they want every last bit of blood they can get out of it. They're taking a number of computers, yeah, so what does that actually shut down the magazine? Because all our magazine is in all those computers, and so if they take any of those computers, we don't have any existing copy, we don't have any back issues, we have every single thing to do with our magazine is on a computer. And I was just in Rolling Stone magazine, and every time I'm in a major A-list media, I get raided, and I was expecting this of some kind. Are you surprised that they're here doing this? No, because they're out to punish me. That's all this has ever been. I mean, like I say, you can you, we do what many, many other people in this city do daily, and they're not on TV, so they don't get raided. I'm on television. I'm on Rolling Stone. I'm attracting you know a lot of attention to the city, and they resent it, and this is their way of punishing me. You're doing a good job, eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they sure. The Canadian press later reported that the third raid on Hemp, B.C. was a joint operation between the Vancouver Police Department and the U.S. Naval Criminal Investigation Service, whose undercover agents were used to try to buy marijuana and then smoke it at Hemp, B.C. in the Cannabis Cafe so that a warrant could be obtained. Both stores were forced to close their doors in 1999. And that's the last time I've ever had a conversation with a police officer. And he just said, Emery, you're done for. I don't care what you do now. Like, you're finished. But you weren't done for, you weren't finished. No, I looked at him and I thought, man, you are a very short-term thinker because I'm never going to give up. I am unrelenting. The smell of U.S. influence and politics was all over every raid on Hemp, B.C. America's war on drugs was being brought by Americans to Canada, and it was interfering with Mark's attempt to end prohibition in Canada. If the American government was going to hamper his efforts in Canada, Emery would have to overgrow that government as well. Emery changed the name of his magazine from Cannabis Canada to Cannabis Culture. Until as late as August of 1998, Emery's direct seed business refused to sell seeds to Americans except in two states that allowed medical marijuana. In the fall of 1998, Emery changed that policy and began selling seeds to all Americans throughout the United States. Having been forced to sell hemp BC in 1998, Emery no longer sold seeds from within a store. Instead, Emery focused on and expanded the mail order side of his seed business. Well, you'd get a money order, or you send a Western Union wire to Mark Emery and order what it is you want and give us an address where to send it, and we mail it off. It's sent out in a regular envelope, no uh, big marijuana leaves on the outside, uh, we protect the seeds from being crushed and send out a bunch of grow information with every order. Ably assisted by Canada Post. Do you cross the border? I never leave Canada. I've never been left for seven years, not going to, and as long as marijuana is illegal in the United States or Canada, I'll never leave. Aided by his catalog in each issue of Cannabis Culture magazine, and by his new website, emeryseeds.com, Emery quickly expanded his customer base the world over, and greatly increased the quality, the quantity, and the variety of the seeds that he sold. This seed, for example, is the White Widow seed. It costs $130 for 10 seeds, and it comes from Amsterdam. It won the Cannabis Cup in 1994. Emery quickly became the world's biggest seed seller. I am probably the world's leading seed seller of marijuana seeds. And the money poured in like a swelling river. People send me a fantastic amount of money, unbelievable amount. We get about 25 letters every day. Our total amount today is $5,332.50, more or less, and that would be pretty consistent uh, for five days a week. In fact, they send me about one and a half to two million dollars just to me personally every year. Now, that's a lot of money. I don't actually live on anything more than about a hundred and some odd thousand dollars a year. So after I started getting raided all the time, I realized, ah, it's no point in me having this money because they're just going to come and take it. And besides that, if I give it away to a whole bunch of other people and they cause lots of shit and subversion, it'll be like a hundred of me out there. Little Mark Emery clones with this money, mm, I will destroy this state, you know, and stuff like that, <laughs> right? So we've given $300,000 away to libertarian cannabis movements in the last year. And we do, it's about $12,000 a week and we'll continue to do that. We spend our money all over the world. We spend it mostly in the United States where the need is greatest and very little in Canada as it turns out. We've sponsored a lot of class action suits against the U.S. government. Three or four class action suits going on against the Canadian government. We gave $20,000 to sue the U.S. government in Philadelphia to make medical marijuana 
one available to uh, patients. We have given endless number of prisoners in jail money and money to their lawyers. That's one of our most important things. We gave money to Steve Cubby's Libertarian Campaign for Vice President. Ballot initiatives, there's the PRA 2000 in Michigan that did not succeed, but we gave money to that. We've given about four or $5,000 to the Free Hemp in Alaska Ballot Initiative, which legalizes marijuana. And uh, all the ballot initiatives along the West Coast we've contributed money to. And substantially, that's what we do. Basically, my job is to raise money to give it away to the people in the movement, since my standard of living doesn't change either way, no matter how much money we get. Emery's plan was working. The anti-prohibition forces and the victims of the war on drugs had the money they needed to fight back and to get out their anti-prohibition message. In 2000, Emery launched one of the internet's first internet-based TV stations, Pot TV. I used to, the revolution that I like to think we started in cannabis started out by being a retail movement. And then I realized, gee, with all these goods and assets around, the police can just walk in and take them all. And that's what they did on several occasions. So, you know, by the fourth one, and I'm not a quick learner in some instances, but, <laughs> but by the fourth asset forfeiture, I said, I've got to get into another line. So that's where we got, became a media organization where there's a lot less to seize that has any real value. And because the value is in the production and the broadcast and the existence of the ideas. I have a, uh, one of the first, if not the first, internet television network. Well, how is Pot TV different from, say, Canada AM? Yeah, well, it's the only broadcast in the world that's substantially about a subject matter that's illegal. But why then can't the police just shut you down? Well, I imagine they can. I've certainly been arrested a lot in British Columbia over marijuana advocacy. I've been arrested ten times, raided four times. They've taken all my assets on four other occasions. So, I mean, they could come in here tomorrow. I mean, I'm, I'm not assured in any way that they won't raid us at any time. And we're here to defend our culture in a vigorous, ambitious way and show that we have pride in the cannabis culture in this country and around the world. And we are trying to get in your face and give them reason to be courageous and proud of their culture. So you don't broadcast opposing points of view? you to yours uh, on our show no 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 the, the the establishment media has been the lapdog for the government persecution for so long we don't we think that there's plenty of propaganda out there representing the government's point of view Emery also became the principal financier for the newly minted marijuana party of Canada and founded the BC marijuana party provincially it was the first party in BC history ever to run a full slate of candidates in its very first election an additional benefit of having started the BC marijuana party was that the party would not need a business license to operate a storefront in downtown Vancouver. Hemp BC had eventually been closed precisely because it could not obtain a business license. With the BC Marijuana Party, Emery was back in business, and Vansterdam began to thrive again.